Good morning. Uh, it's a beautiful, fine morning. Spring, everything is uh, growing and uh, coming back to life uh, after a long winter. Also, ostrich ferns. Ostrich fern is very common in gardens. You can recognize it by the fact that it's got separate generative um, shoots with spores and hasn't got any spores on the underside of the leaves and often grows in clumps like here because it reproduces from underground suckers so you can usually find hundreds of thousands of them. Also in parks and cemeteries this is a very classic site for it. Uh, this fern used to be called Mateusia strutiopteris and the range of this species encompassed both North America and Eurasia. But recently, however, the plant was moved to the genus Onoclea, which is called the sensitive fern, as a result of genetic studies. So it, it divided the Eurasian and North American populations into, into two separate species, Onoclea pensilvatica in America and Onoclea strutiopteris in Eurasia. Um, Ostrich ferns are quite robust and they usually like growing in damp places. I have a few, at least two ecotypes varieties. One is quite early and this one is the latest. I wonder what is the origin of it because most ostrich ferns in Poland are already developed. So this one is about 10 or even 14 days behind. So the American Onoclea pensilvatica grows in nearly the whole of North America, whereas the Eurasian ostrich fern is restricted to the area from Central Europe to Japan and Southern China, so it avoids Western Europe, although it's very common in, in parks and, and gardens there. So I think this is probably the tastiest um, edible fern in the world. I assume you can eat most, maybe all, but not all, but most ferns in small amounts after thorough cooking if you use the fiddleheads. So here you can, even when they are at this uh, stage, you just break off the fiddlehead and you can still use it. So it doesn't have to be near to, near to the ground. You have a few weeks to, to use them. This is the last moment. So you would collect um, lots of these um, fiddleheads and boil them and take the water out. This is a safety procedure I use for most wild vegetables unless I know they are really, really tasty raw. Actually, ostrich fern tastes of peas and it's really, really tasty, but still I would advise cooking it, especially that there were some uh, cases of mild poison, uh, poisoning associated with ostrich fern in New York and Canada in 1994, but it's really unclear why it happened. Um, that maybe there were some toxic agents and also in these restaurants where the, these mild um, indigestions were reported the, the, the fern was just blanched. So I would advise longer cooking like 10 minutes, 5 minutes at least. In Asia, in China, uh, fern fiddleheads are often dried and used after drying which also reduces most of the toxicity. There are actually no reports of this plant being used in Europe, but it's very common, commonly used in, in America and, and it's got, um, bo used both in, in the United States and Canada, especially Maine on the border of Canada and, and, um, and uh, United States is very, very common. Various names, fiddle neck fern, fougère à l'autruche, uh, tête de violon, um, Cross de Fougère, if I pronounce my terrible French properly. In 2012, I was editing a volume of Acta Societatis Botanicorum Polonia about the edible wild plants of the world. It's available online, free PDF download. And I um, invited the renowned uh, researcher of wild foods of North America, Professor Nancy Turner, to write a paper about how Europeans learned wild foods from Native Americans and um, she and her colleague from Canada, Patrick von Aderkas, devoted a passage to the use of, of Mateusia, of, of ostrich fern. Um, so 
originally they were consumed by the original inhabitants of, of North America and they were um, also the, the rhizomes were used they were cleaned and pit cooked um, and they were important for the Malacity, Penobscot and Passamaquoddy Indians of New Brunswick and Maine and the Malacity Indians of New Brunswick called it Maxos the circling movement of, um, a dog makes as it lies down Maxos also has a magical meaning. This fern has been common in North American cuisine since 1783. As the American War of Independence was ending, many, many <coughs> Americans loyal to the British Crown left New York and Boston for New Brunswick. The traveling soldiers were starving, and the local Malay City Indians showed um, the migrants how to use this fern. In the springtime, um, the um, uh, Malacities cooked the young leaves in animal fat and ate them. Um, they also used this food to kill intestinal worms. And with time, um, fiddleheads became a culinary tradition among the people who lived in the St. John River Valley. The fern's popularity spread in the, in the 19th century to other parts of Canada and also to the US. And now it's still a very common harvest in Canada and, and the United States. My colleague botanist from Poland, Professor Beata Zagurska-Marek, um, also sent me information about Polish people living in, in Eastern Canada who have a special dish, uh, which is um, called in French, uh, fiddleheads à la polonaise, Polish style, which means with breadcrumbs and black pepper fried in butter the same way runner beans are served in Poland. Um, this fern is also highly appreciated in Asia. For example, in Japan it's called Kogomi or Kusasotetsu. Kogomi comes from Kagam, which means bending or stooping. The other name, Kusasotetsu, stems from Sotetsu, means cycads. Uh, Winifred Baird uh, suggested blanching the fiddleheads and dressing them with shoyu or katsuo flakes or lightly crushed sesame seeds or using them in aemono, itamemono, nimono, sunomono or tempura. Winifred Bird wrote this amazing book, Eating Wild Japan, which I highly recommend and if you are interested in wild foods you should read it. It's an excellent introduction to Japanese wild foods. Uh, also, I saw this plant being eaten in central China in the Qingning Mountains near Xi'an when the Shanxi province when where people use it um, a lot and highly appreciate it's one of the favorite vegetables and they collect the tips and use them after short boiling or drying. I also would like to boast about the fact that I'm approaching a thousand subscribers so if you haven't subscribed you have a chance to be the thousandth person and um, I think it's uh, worth developing this site because I can see people from many countries entering it. Of course, as I live in Northern Hemisphere and in, in temperate climate, it's mainly devoted to this kind of food, but also to the wild edible plants of the world. So wherever I go, I will try to post something about it. And I also recommend you buying this book, Edible Ferns of the World, which I wrote last year.